This fragile reel of tape contains the voice of one of the most feared men in history. Everyone knows his name. But it is also in a voice we have never heard before. You will discover that his voice is quite a pleasant one. This is a fragment of the only recording that exists of Adolf Hitler speaking privately, not as a screaming actor on the world stage, but as an inhuman being using the full power of his personality to bend another man to his will. This thin piece of magnetic tape directly connects us to the real Adolf Hitler. And it is an extraordinary window into the mind and madness of one of history's most terrifying figures. By analyzing what Hitler says and how he says it, it is possible to go back in time and come face to face with a human monster. It is time to listen to the Hitler tape. This is the Adolf Hitler we think we know. But this is just a caricature. Images culled from the Nazi propaganda machine. There is another Adolf Hitler we do not know. A soft-spoken, almost charming conversationalist. In his reign of terror, Hitler made only one mistake where he let his guard down, where he was captured speaking not on stage, but behind closed doors. And so came this Verzögerung. Had I in the year 1939, then the world would have When I heard the tape for the first time, it became much more clear to me why other politicians had, for some time at least, believed in Hitler's words. This tape was recorded in a private train car in Finland on June the 4th, 1942. The man Hitler was speaking to was Marshal Karl Gustav Mannerheim, Commander-in-Chief of the Finnish Armed Forces. The Finnish recording is the only one of its kind. I think it is a key to understand the way how Hitler dealt with his partners, his style, the way he tries to seduce Mannerheim, to convince him. Gustav Mannerheim is still revered in Finland. He led Finland in its fight for independence from Russia in 1917. And during the Second World War, Mannerheim fought two of the 20th century's most lethal regimes to a draw. As a token of a nation's continuing esteem, his personal train car has been preserved as a museum. It was within a private room in this car where radio technician Tor Domain recorded over 11 minutes of Hitler speaking privately with Mannerheim. Today, this extraordinary recording lies hidden in the sound archives of Yulis Radio, Yuli for short, the Finnish national broadcasting company in Helsinki. Within this archive, 300,000 tapes are stored, but this tape is special. I have said always that uh, this tape is the most valuable tape in our archive because it is the only tape in the world where Hitler speaks freely. Adolf Hitler was defined by his public image, and the Nazis carefully manufactured that image. The Nazis had turned propaganda into a fine art and a deadly weapon. A terrifying but persuasive lie that millions believed. The leading actor was Adolf Hitler. Hitler's image was complex. He needed the Germans to believe in him, to love him, and to fear him. He accumulated absolute power by developing a pseudo-religious mystical cult of his own personality. Hitler could act well enough his acting style and so, but he was put there by the masses. If he had spoken like a priest, no one would have listened. <laughs> Hitler adapted his image to suit each situation. 
Here, addressing Parliament, he spoke diplomatically, playing the intelligent statesman. Here, with industrialists, he spoke and dressed like a businessman. When Hitler addressed Nazi party meetings, his tone is unmistakably violent, playing the rabble-rouser. The pictures you can see made of Hitler in the papers and books are censored. For instance, you will never see Hitler with his hands in his pockets. Hitler with his hands in his pockets might appear relaxed, and that was precisely the image he did not want to present. Hitler's public image wasn't only built up by the propaganda machine, it was also refined and distilled, stripped down to the bare essentials. In Germany, there was a strict censorship, especially with everything dealing with the Führer, the leader himself. Photographs, as well as interviews, were strictly controlled. Hitler's public image presented him as a superman, a man invested with godlike powers. Here in the film Triumph of the Will, the message is clear. Hitler is descending from the heavens like a deity. This deity had no time for friendship or family, no time to even drink alcohol. He devoted his life to the power and resurgent glory of the new Germany. The Nazis' propaganda was to promote Adolf Hitler's role as their prophet. The Nazi party was to become the only religion. Throughout all the propaganda, Hitler's image is that of a solitary man standing in the eye of the hurricane of hate that he is whipping up around himself. He was a consummate actor, always aware that the eyes of a mass audience were upon him. And in front of that audience, he could be whoever he wanted to be. He was certainly a good speaker. He was a propagandist. He didn't stammer. He always spoke fluently. Today, those speeches have been excerpted and edited in ways that obliterate their original meaning. But when Hitler is allowed to speak within the original context, his power of persuasion is unmistakable. He was one of the first modern politicians to truly understand the awesome power and influence of the media. He and his advisors micromanaged every public appearance. He played a role. It was different roles, as we know, meanwhile, uh, but performance was part of his nature. And that's what makes this tape so extraordinary. Not just because someone managed to record it, but because of the way Hitler sounds. Charming, relaxed, perhaps most shockingly, utterly reasonable. This is nothing like the Hitler we think we know, so much so that some believe this recording is a forgery. Sometimes it feels okay, but at other points not. I have the feeling it's someone mimicking Hitler. Could this carefully modulated voice really be that of Adolf Hitler? Dr. Stefan Gefrorer, head of forensic speech analysis at the Bundeskriminalamt, the German FBI, will help unravel this mystery. This unique recording of Adolf Hitler speaking privately captures a side of Hitler never before heard. For that reason, some believe it may be a hoax. It really sounds as if someone is mimicking him. The truth is in the details. Hitler's sworn enemy, the Soviet Union, had invaded and occupied part of Finland in November of 1939. Two years later, after Hitler invaded Russia, unoccupied Finland used the opportunity to attack Russia and reclaim its lost territory. One year later, Adolf Hitler decided to travel to Finland for the first time to meet face to face with Finnish Field Marshal Gustav Mannerheim. He prepared this visit uh, several weeks before his trip to Finland, but he kept his plans in total secrecy. And one day before, this means the 3rd of June 1942, he gave some information to Mannerheim himself that he will come next day. He wanted to keep uh, the trip secret. June the 4th was Mannerheim's birthday, and Hitler planned on attending. Mannerheim's birthday had once been cause for public celebration, 
But now, because of the war, it was to be held secretly. This was no party. It was a strategic necessity. Mannerheim and Finland were trapped between two tyrants, hoping one would destroy the other. Hitler needed Mannerheim as well, for far less noble reasons. In June 1942, Hitler was unquestionably the most powerful man on the planet. Hitler had devastated the Soviet Union, and six months after Pearl Harbor, the United States was still only beginning to recover. Hitler's war had gone well, but not well enough, and this was no birthday celebration. Well, I think the moment for Hitler's visit to Finland was chosen very cleverly. On the one hand, it was a in the broader context of grand strategy. Hitler's blitzkrieg, lightning war, had bogged down in the Soviet Union. He needed the Finns to fight by his side, tying down as much of the massive Soviet army as possible. Hitler understood the meeting with Mannerheim very much as the meeting of two soldiers. He wished to meet him as a comrade, as a comrade in arms. Hitler's day began here in East Prussia. Today, an overgrown forest. In the summer of 1942, these ruined bunkers housed the command center of the Nazi military state, the infamous Wolf's Lair. Hitler usually stays up very late and likes to sleep until noon. But on the morning of June the 4th, Adolf Hitler has an appointment to keep. And at 8.30 a.m., his private plane, a converted Focke-Wulf 200 Condor bomber, rolled onto this airstrip and prepared to take off. But there was a problem. The brakes were jammed, a sometimes lethal design flaw of the Condor. These brake drums could catch fire on takeoff, and when the wheels were retracted, the burning tires would be lying directly under the fuel tanks. The problem was fixed, and Hitler took off. The security arrangements for Hitler's flight were intense. As he was flying past a war zone, anti-aircraft guns bristled, but German guns were ordered into silence. In the Baltic Sea, Finnish and German boats patrolled, ready to fight or ready to rescue. Nothing was left to chance. This Nazi newsreel documented the historic visit. And the making of this newsreel shows just how carefully Hitler's public image was controlled. Here, as Finland's president, Reedy, greets Hitler, two men carrying equipment run into frame and out again. Two seconds later, two Finnish cameramen enter. What this film cleverly conceals is that when Hitler landed in Finland, his plane narrowly missed hitting a factory chimney breaking so hard on landing that one wheel caught fire. This Finnish camera crew captured this burning tire, a tire blazing immediately below the fuel tanks. The German cameraman couldn't wait as Hitler sat under a time bomb, so he films as Hitler climbs down through the smoke. Unlike the choreographed landing in The Triumph of the Will, this farcical landing has to be rescued in the film cutting room. These extras are not carrying cameras. They are carrying fire extinguishers. This is a classic example of how Hitler's image was manipulated, how nothing would compromise what would today be called a photo op. Hitler has to see and smell smoke from this burning rubber, but he pretends it isn't happening. He maintains his focus on his image and his mission, and that mission was about to begin. While these official greetings were being filmed at the airfield, sound engineer Torn Domain set up microphones inside Mannerheim's special train. Hitler was to record a short speech in the dining car for public consumption in Finland. They prepared the uh, train. They put uh, several microphones in the restaurant wagon where Marshal Mannerheim received the guests. Domain had positioned two microphones between the luggage racks over Mannerheim's table in the dining car. The cable ran outside to where Domain had set up his recording equipment, two state-of-the-art reel-to-reel tape recorders. 
They wired these microphones securely to fit the space, hiding them in birch leaves so they were barely visible. At this table, they served Hitler his own special meal, a food taster having made sure the dish was not poisoned. The official speeches were recorded in the dining car, but the true affairs of state would be discussed in the privacy of Mannerheim's personal salon car. The public speech was recorded as planned, and then the men adjourned for a private meeting. As the men walked across the plank to the salon car, Domain hastily moved his microphones to the new location. He wanted to be prepared in case any more official remarks needed to be recorded. Hitler began a casual but secret conversation with Mannerheim. It was time for his real work of personal persuasion to begin. But outside, Tor Domain makes a momentous decision. Having set up his microphones, he decides to keep recording the now private conversation. Henrik Domain is Tor's son. The story of how this recording was made has become family legend, beginning with the secret installation of the microphones. Since my father was responsible for the recording there, so he, he found out that he couldn't record. The microphones were in the wrong car, so he took a microphone and went to the salon wagon, which had a window open, and he threw the microphone up to the baggage compartment. Wenn mir jemand gesagt hätte, dass ein Staat mit 35.000 Tanks anreden kann, dann hätte ich gesagt, sie sind Wahnsinn. He thought that he will make a good service for his uh, army and his uh, fatherland. Tor Domain put himself in mortal danger. The SS men guarding Hitler were trained to shoot first and ask questions later. But donning his headphones, Domain began to listen to the most significant sound recording of his life. But after 11 minutes, Hitler's guards realized what Tor Domain was doing. A German officer noticed and he demanded to stop immediately to record the conversation. One of the German guards pointed a finger at Domain and made a cutthroat gesture. Incredibly, the Germans didn't shoot, and even though they were furious, they didn't even confiscate the tape. And said, if this had happened in Germany, you have cut your head off. Apparently, the recording was saved because the SS guards didn't dare to tarnish Hitler's media event, as shooting a Finn for spying or destroying Finnish radio property would have caused a major diplomatic conflict with one of Germany's most vital allies. The guards had to find a compromise. They ordered the tape to be sealed, never to be opened. These broken wax seals are still on the tape box. Afterwards, uh, naturally, the Finns uh, opened the boxes and listened to what Hitler has told to Mannerheim. Then the tape vanished into history and the domain cellar. Now exhumed, it seems to present a Hitler unknown to history, a stranger even to one of the last men alive who stood by Hitler's side. That wasn't Hitler, of course. That's not the way Hitler spoke. It sounds like it could be an actor. No, 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 it's not Hitler's voice. I can't accept that this is Hitler's voice. Rokas Misch was at Hitler's beck and call from 1940 to the dictator's suicide in 1945. And Misch was also Hitler's private switchboard operator. If anyone still living knows Hitler, it is Misch. For as Hitler's private operator, he could distinguish Hitler's voice from all the other Nazi leaders. Sometimes it seems okay, but at other points not. I have the feeling it's someone mimicking Hitler. Well, if Misch finds this voice pleasant, uh, this is not surprising to me because I guess that his experience with Hitler's voice was in a totally different setting. In order to definitely prove that this is Hitler's private voice, we asked audio analysts to compare Hitler's official June 4th speech to the covert recording made a few minutes later. 
First, we had to protect this priceless artifact by digitally transferring the analog reel-to-reel -reel recording to a modern CD-ROM. This is the original tape recorded by Tudemann in 42. And you have to be careful with the tape because it's quite fragile. It cuts easily just by itself if you don't handle it carefully. Like that, you see, there's one. <laughs> Then, audio analyst Stefan Gefreurer compared the source with the other Hitler speech recorded a few minutes earlier on the same microphones. We splice together segments of speech from the two different recordings. And we usually do this in order to, to listen if, if there is a sudden change in world behavior or in the, how the voice sounds. And uh, what we find here is that it's, it stays exactly the same. So it's, it's obvious for us that it is one voice. Our analysis leaves no doubt. This is Adolf Hitler. As close as Rokas Misch was to Hitler, he was not close enough to ever hear this voice. People are surprised at how pleasant he seems. But what can account for this relaxed, almost charming, low-key voice? There might be a very unscientific explanation. Hitler may have been drinking alcohol at his lunch. I do know he would drink Fene Branca before addressing a big gathering. He drank a digestive spirit. Contrary to the Nazi propaganda legend that always portrayed him as being disciplined and sober. In fact, Hitler seems to have a glass of some spirit in front of him here with Mannerheim. Apparently not that unusual an occurrence. And I saw him drinking beer, traveling in the train, in the restaurant car. I was eating there and I saw him drinking a beer, a Holzkirchnerbräu. This extraordinary series of photographs of the meeting, taken by a Finnish military photographer, also uncovers a discrepancy in the Domain family legend of a secretly placed microphone. The microphones were in the wrong car, so he took a microphone and went to the salon wagon, which had a window open, and he threw the microphone up to the baggage compartment. There's no microphone on this picture, where it's obvious this is the conversation between Mannerheim and, and Hitler. What is striking is that this little model plane that bears the German cross on its side. In this photograph of Hitler and Mannerheim on the sofa in the private salon car, we can see that on the table, out of focus, is a model airplane, a Stuka dive bomber. There's another photo where you can see a wing of a model plane with a German cross. On this picture, there's also a microphone that is obviously visible and not uh, hidden at all. So if this is the same room, where the conversation was recorded and the microphone was obviously not hidden. Tor Domain's microphone was plainly visible. Hitler could not have missed it. But no one told him the tape was still rolling. And what it captured is revealing. The secret tape shows that he has a broader spectrum of behavior, of performances, than one would expect. You couldn't distinguish him from any serious statesman in the world when listening to the tape. This tape is a window into the mind of Adolf Hitler. Indisputably authentic, it illuminates his working methods and shows firsthand his powers of persuasion. The way he presents himself is quite different, and this is something which we haven't paid attention to. We can now go back in time to the summer of 1942 and uncover a new perspective on World War II directly from the man who started it. This is living history, the only existing recording of how Adolf Hitler presented himself behind closed doors. Hitler was caught speaking candidly with Finnish military leader Karl Mannerheim as part of a carefully choreographed ballet of deception. The conversation seems pleasant, one friend to another. But what did Mannerheim really feel about Hitler? Raw footage taken that same day provides some clues. Here, Hitler is clearly putting on a show, but Mannerheim listens skeptically 
He seems bored, politely hiding his irritation. Here, Hitler presents Mannerheim with a gift of two armored staff cars. As soon as Mannerheim breaks eye contact with Hitler, he looks irritated. Alone with his Finnish soldiers and politicians, Mannerheim is very relaxed, treating his comrades with affection. But here, his expression conveys dislike and distrust of Hitler. While the film cameras recorded Hitler crossing the plank to Mannerheim's train, a Finnish photographer caught a candid image. As Hitler almost clowns on the gangplank, in the background, Mannerheim smiles, his expression enigmatic, a symbol of a tense relationship strained by the Finns' adamant refusal to cooperate in any way with Hitler's Holocaust. Finland having saved the lives of thousands of foreign Jewish refugees by moving them over its border to neutral Sweden. There were Jewish soldiers in the Finnish army, a very tragic situation of soldiers fighting along with the Germans for a cause of which they didn't know what would come out and it would be a tragedy, uh, especially to the Jewish soldiers, whether they would win or lose. But for the moment at least, Hitler needed Finland as much as Finland temporarily needed Germany. Hitler's main purpose in making his visit to Finland was to convince the Finns to remain on Germany's side. And in order to do that, he had, first of all, to explain the German failures of the last winter. Adolf Hitler was about to be trapped by his own words as he unwittingly reveals his true and sinister intentions. The discussion on the tape centers on the Soviet Union. In it, Hitler confesses that he underestimated their strength when he attacked in June of 1941. Mannerheim agreed. He had already fought the Red Army in the 1939 Winter War. He had tested the Russian strength. Here, Hitler talks like a businessman who has underestimated his competitors. Hitler tried to appear serious to Mannerheim, to give the impression of a competent leader whom you could trust. But for Hitler, trust was just another weapon in his arsenal of deceit. Listen now to how he imparts a sense of shock and amazement at the Russian strength, but only to bolster his own credibility. Heute ist gerade eine Panzerfabrik, die in der ersten Schicht etwas über 30.000 und in den Vollausbau über 60.000 Arbeiter beschäftigt sind. Eine einzige Panzerfabrik. Wir haben sie besetzt. Eine gigantische Fabrik. One single tank factory, we occupied it, a gigantic tank factory. So he uses a lot of modulation to show that even he was impressed by this size. On the tape, Hitler dramatizes his ignorance of Russian strength, at the same time brushing it aside to emphasize his own power. Mannerheim seems to agree. This is the last time we hear Mannerheim speaking on the tape. From this point on, Hitler talks in an uninterrupted monologue. I don't know why it's just Hitler talking, you know, it's, it's not uh, what you would expect if, if people sit and talk uh, at a birthday party. He does not expect somebody to interrupt him. Hitler, the actor, takes over. Listen now to how he makes himself sound weak and vulnerable. 
Lebenswerte drin, um die aufzutauchen. Das sehen wir heute besser, als wir es damals vielleicht noch erkannt haben. Treaties only served to buy Hitler time. Even before the Hitler-Stalin Pact was signed, he was planning to attack Soviet Russia. But first, he needed to conquer France, an invasion successfully concluded in the summer of 1940. On the tape, he reveals that he wanted to invade six months earlier. Hitler then speaks about late 1939, the period when Stalin attacked Finland, and Hitler was planning to attack France, the first major step on the road to subjugating Europe. We see in Herbst 1939, immer vor der Frage stand, ich wollte in der Altumstellung angreifen. Und ich war überzeugt, dass in sechs Wochen mit Frankreich fertig werden würde. Hitler is boasting, and his hubris is audible. He wanted to attack under all conditions, so this is very strong. Hitler's blitzkrieg tactics depended on all conditions being favorable. Hitler had invaded France once before as an ordinary soldier in World War I. Hitler did not shrink from telling the truth about his conquest of France, a nation which had wanted to help the Finns in 1939. It is not surprising that Karl Mannerheim, a true officer and a gentleman, had fallen silent. June 4th, 1942. In a private train car, Adolf Hitler didn't know that his private conversation with Finnish commander Marshal Mannerheim was being recorded, every word and every nuance being transcribed by history. There is something special about his voice. Uh, maybe it's a little bit hoarse, and his intonation is very interesting because he uses a strong dynamic accent and he uh, changes, he modulates his voice very much, and this is maybe one of the factors that some people might find it pleasant. For Hitler, seduction was just as effective a weapon as threats. He mainly left the bullying and threatening to his SS and Gestapo underlings. He was a good speaker. He could inspire people with his style of speaking. That was his strength, too. It was also his strength when he faced his admirals and generals. He could assert himself, even when they didn't agree with him. Our analysis concludes that the tape is genuine, but how genuine was Hitler? In his cold-blooded calculus, one reason he invaded Russia was simply to ensure access to nearby Romanian oil. In war, access to raw materials can mean the difference between victory and defeat. Hitler had positioned an army of 200,000 German soldiers in the north of Scandinavia to secure the vital nickel mines there. But the tape reveals that Hitler suspected that Stalin was eyeing the Romanian oil fields to the south. But Hitler couldn't stop now. By attacking Soviet Russia, Hitler had placed the German Reich in a struggle to the death. When Germany attacked the Soviet Union, they decided to sell this attack as a preventive war, which could be seen as a moral justification for the attack. But Hitler didn't attack Russia because he thought Stalin was threatening Germany. Hitler attacked Russia because he thought Stalin was weak. It would be a fatal miscalculation. Germany's overall situation in the summer of 1942 was pretty desperate. Hitler was masterful at playing the victim. 
every war he began was presented as an act of self-defense. This invasion of the Soviet Union was no different. Now Hitler casually circles back to the subject that had brought him to Mannerheim, Finland. This is the heart of the conversation where Hitler has to persuade Mannerheim that he has always looked out for Finland's welfare. Even Hitler knew full well that was a lie. Back in 1939, during the brief period when Hitler and Stalin were allies, Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov had been keen to stake the Soviet claim to the Finnish territories. First by the visit from Molotov, in this part of the recording where he's uh, telling the story about his conversation with Molotov, he's not just telling what happened and not describing the situation, he's really acting it out, maybe in order to be more credible. Hitler seems to be saying that he was warning Molotov that he might intervene if Russia were to attack Finland. But at exactly this time, the fall of 1939, Hitler was making his unholy pact with Stalin. The Hitler-Stalin pact had a secret clause that gave Finland to Stalin. This was the real reason why Hitler had not helped Finland when the Soviets attacked them in 1939. But this was something the Finns knew nothing about. They simply couldn't understand why the Germans, who, in their perception, had always taken part in favor of Finnish independence, now uh, remained passive. Hitler is performing at his best. Although he had handed Stalin Finland on a platter, he is acting as if he were the great defender of the Finns. I do not think that anyone knew the real Hitler, and I doubt whether the real Hitler existed. Hitler always performed in one way or the other. But as Hitler arrived at the airstrip to fly home, he may have known that he had failed in his mission. He had not convinced Mannerheim that Germany was a reliable ally. Hitler's war would grind on, and as the tide turned against Germany, so too would Finland. The final reality of Hitler's attempted seduction of Mannerheim was when he turned on the man whose birthday he had just celebrated. Two years after this meeting, the Finns declared war on Germany and signed a peace treaty with the Soviet Union. The betrayed Finns had turned on their German betrayer. Hitler showed his true colors. He wanted his revenge and ordered a scorched earth policy. Retreating German forces destroyed more than a third of all dwellings in Finnish Lapland. They burned whole cities to the ground and left the territory booby-trapped with mines. A man who built an empire out of lies was true to his character, a character that was expressed not only in what he said, but in how he said it. Having heard uh, Hitler speak the way he did with Mannerheim, it is easier to understand why others could believe him. He is convincing in the way he speaks, at least for those who wished to believe him. It is shockingly easy to forget who you are listening to in this recording. The banality of evil has never been so apparent. When Hitler refers to the Soviet factory workers as animals, the consequences of this offhand attitude would be the deaths of literally millions of Soviet prisoners, casually worked and starved to oblivion. When Hitler ruminates about invading France in 1939, six months earlier than his actual 1940 attack, the devastating consequences of the invasion and fall of France might almost be forgotten. And looming over this conversation like a shroud is the Holocaust, which would forever define Adolf Hitler and his particular brand of evil. At 10 past six, the monster's work was over. 
Hitler said his farewells to Mannerheim and boarded his plane for the return flight. Ironically, at exactly this moment, 6,000 miles away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, one of the pivotal battles of the Second World War was beginning. American naval and air forces were engaging Japanese aircraft carriers in the Battle of Midway. The Japanese fleet would never recover. The tide of the war in the Pacific turned. But as he flew home, Hitler knew nothing of the losses his number one ally had suffered. This accordion music signals the moment when Tor Domain stopped his machine, for the tape had been used once before to record a concert. But fortunately, Domain bravely managed to preserve 11 minutes that remind us of a time when absolute evil wore a human face. Eight months later, Hitler would suffer his own catastrophic defeat at Stalingrad. The war that Hitler's powers of persuasion began would end in these ruins of his bunker. This tape connects us with that past and stands as a warning to the future.